Welcome. Today, we would like to discuss uh, two different attacks, very standard attacks against RSA. One of them is Pollard's row factorization method. So in this one, what we're interested in is uh, directly factoring the modulus. And remember, when you factor the modulus n, then you immediately have phi of n, and you're able to invert e mod phi of n, recover d, the secret exponents. So uh, factoring is assumed to be hard for this. Uh, you know, we hope that to be hard, and, and under that assumption, only under the assumption can uh, RSA be secure. But there's always hard does not mean impossible, and so we need to know the best ways to factor a number. And so Pollard's row algorithm is a way to not the best way we know, but a standard way to factor uh, integers. So the goal here is to create a situation where we have a, a relationship of the form x squared is e congruent to y squared uh, minus five, minus, uh, sorry, modulo n, okay? If that happens, then what you'll have is this relationship here, and then you have x minus y ti uh, times x plus y is congruent to uh, zero mod n, and that means that n divides the product of those two elements, and then, uh, four different things can happen. So um, the P and Q's of N can distribute uh, uh, in, uh, in X minus one and X plus Y, or they can go both, they could both go in the product of one of those two terms. But if they nicely distribute, then uh, what we have is the GCD of, of X minus one and X uh, and N was going to be either P or Q. If that's the case, then you factored n because uh, once you know one of the two factors, then uh, you will find the other factor by dividing n by the factor you found. Now, uh, of course, you can always uh, find one or n is possible, and that comes from the fact that just the fact that n divides those two numbers does not necessarily mean that p goes in one and q goes in the, in, in, the, in the other one. It could be that, in fact, p and q go in the product of x minus y. So how do we uh, uh, create this uh, congruence relation that hopefully leads to the factorization of n? We use Floyd cycle detection. So given a sequence, so that's a, a more general task, and then we'll, pre we'll present it in, in this more general way. Uh, given a sequence of uh, uh, defined inductively by xi equals uh, a function h of xi minus 1, we want to find two xi's that are equal. Okay, so what that means, if you you can uh, you can visualize that, where uh, starting from h zero and then uh, um, applying h inductively, is that at some point you will loop back to a value that you had previously calculated. Okay, and that's uh, going to be our collision, and um, we're going to be we're going to use that. Uh, for um, calculating uh, a factor uh, of, of n. So assume that, for example, p is one of those factors, then you can define h of x as a polynomial uh, of degree 2 uh, modulo p, so a x squared plus b mod p. And assume that you have found a collision, so we have h of xi equals h h of xy, xj, sorry, then you have this relationship, and then x minus, uh, xi minus xj and xi plus xj are divisible by p, and then what we have is that the GCD of xi minus xj and n is going to be p. Now there is a uh, strong caveat here. I defined the function h, which you will need in order to find the cycle, I defined it from p, p being one of the secrets that you're trying to find. Now, of course, this means that such, uh, given this definition, I will not be able to evaluate h, so the definition has to be slightly different. In fact, what you can do is, instead of reducing things mod p, you can reduce things mod n, okay? And so by doing this, you, uh, you still retain the 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 cycle detection aspect of it meaning that you you will test at every step of the way uh, every time you want to test if you have 
xi minus xj, uh, xi square is congruent to xj square mod p, what you will test is the GCD of xi minus xj and n, okay? And so if it's not equal to one, then it means that you will have found, found uh, your element. So here is the description of the algorithm and then we will uh, uh, see how it works on the example. So it starts on two identical values and then we create two sequences, the xi's and the yi's. And what we do is the xi is defined inductively as h of xi uh, minus one and yi is, in defined, is defined inductively where uh, we go at twice the speed. So we do h of h of y i minus one. So we have those two sequences that take values among the same set, but the y sequence, morally speaking, goes twice as fast as the x sequence. And then if we have an x i that equals a y i, then we'll say that uh, we have a collision for the indices i and two i. So, uh, how does this work uh, in an example where we've defined our function as a polynomial mod n? So here, what we have is p of x, uh, our polynomial is x squared plus one, okay? And then we have x zero and y zero equals two, our starting points. Then at the first stage, what we have is here xi, so x one is going to be x zero squared plus one mod n. And then yi is going to be, first we calculate this five and then we get it into p of x a second time, reduce mod n, and that gives us our first y1. And then we take the GCD, we test if the GCD of x1 minus y1 is not, with the number n is non-trivial. We find that it is trivial, it is one, so we learn nothing about the factorization of 8051 and we repeat uh, another time. So this is five square plus one mod n. So we, we notice here that x1 is in fact, sorry, x2 is in fact y1, and that's because y goes twice the pace as x. And then here y, you take 26, apply p1, apply p twice, reduce, and then you found 7,474 test the GCD of x2 minus y2 and n, you still find one. And then you iterate the process and we, we, with these two numbers, it turns out the GCD you find is 97, which means that you factored n. Now, why is this interesting? Well, what's interesting is that we know how to bound the time that it takes to find a collision. So let's call t the index where uh, you've got your, your uh, uh, first repetition here uh, and L the length of the loop. Remember when you, st when, you re when you reach your first repetition here because of the inductive definition of the sequence, you will only repeat uh, values that you've already calculated before. But there is a first index which is starting from here and up to here, boom, you count that the index here was t. And then l is the length of the loop. And then we find a collision uh, after at most t plus l steps. Now to prove this, we need to calculate j. So this is a definition that we give, right? So we, we calculate j to be t, so for the t we define, minus t mod l plus l. Now that j, what is so special about this j? First of all, j is greater than t, okay? And that's because uh, you have that t mod l is less than l, so l minus t mod l is positive, so you have j is at least t. What does it tell us about j is that it's an index that is at least in the loop, okay? So you are, you, you've, you've passed this point of first collision and so j is somewhere in here. And then we know that L divides j. So what does this mean? Because we have that 2j minus j equals j and then L divides 2j minus j. Um, and that's so what we have is uh, the following. Um, <clears throat> because L divides j, um, so 
sorry, uh, let me recap just a little bit. L divides J because T minus T mod L is divisible by L, and then we're adding L, so we have a, a number that is divisible by L. Uh, and so 2J minus J equals J, and so L divides J. And uh, L divides 2J minus J. And so what it means is uh, the, the X at index 2J and the X at index J, they're uh, separated by a number of, of uh, indices that is a multiple of L. And because it's a multiple of L, so for example, you could be here with XJ, and then you know that from XJ to X2J, you've done a number of indices that is a multiple of L, which means basically you've fallen back on your feet. So we've created an index J such that we know that XJ and X2J lie on the same position on the loop, which means basically that XJ and YJ are the same. And looking at the value J, we see that it's less than T plus L, right? It's T plus L minus something positive. So it's at most, it's at most T plus L. And so we've proven our, uh, we've proven our, um, our statement, okay? Now it's interesting because then it allows us to bound the number of steps that we have to perform. And in particular, it's bounded by P and P itself is bounded by square root of n when p and q are about the same size. I mean, when you pick p and q, p or q, uh, you, you you pick it to be the smallest of the two primes, then you have that the number of steps is at most square root n. So you can give here a bound on the number of steps. Now, um, another way uh, we we can uh, we'll present another attack that we present is uh, continued uh, based on the continued fraction expansions. So what is a continued fraction expansion? Um, it's uh, a way to uh, uh, write a fraction. So uh, it's, you, you write a, a, a rational number uh, and, and you, can, um, you, you can generalize this by taking, uh, 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 taking infinite uh, uh, writings of this form here. So given the coefficients a0, a1, a2, a simple continued fraction expansion defined by those coefficients is this uh, uh, limit here, okay? So where we continue, we can have an infinite uh, sequence if we want. If the sequence is finite, then we fall back on a rational number. Now, how do we calculate the continued fraction expansion of a number? So let's assume that we're given a number x Okay, and we want to know how to write it down as a continued fraction expansion. So we take a0 to be the floor of x, and then we say that x equals a0 uh, plus a fractional part, okay, which is between 0 and 1. And then our first approximation of x is going to be the fraction a0 over 1, which is a very coarse approximation, of course. But we can make this more precise by taking one over epsilon zero and write it down again as an integral part and a fractional part. And then we have a one. Uh, uh, so a one is the floor of one over epsilon zero and epsilon one is this. And so what it gives you is that X now can be written down as one over a one plus epsilon one and it, an approximation of it, which is a rational function is a zero plus one over a one, okay? So here we have a slightly better approximation of our number x, which may or may not be a rational number, by a rational number. And we can continue this. So we iterate the process. We invert epsilon 1, separate the integral and the fractional parts. And then we have that uh, x is a0 plus 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2 plus epsilon 2, which is can be approximated by the rational number a0 plus 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2. And so I, when we iterate the process, we get new new uh, uh, fractions. Each fraction uh, of this form is called one of the convergence, okay? And so they're uh, rational numbers that approximate your input x. So uh, let's see, for example, uh, what it's like with pi. So uh, Pi of, uh, so the, the fractional part of phi, 
sorry, the, um, the floor of pi is going to be three. And so you have epsilon, so that is going to be a zero. And then what we have is epsilon zero, as you know, the, this is going to be uh, the, the decimal, oops, the decimal parts, sorry, the, um, the fractional part. So the decimals of, um, of pi, so 14, 15, 90, uh, 92, 65, etc. Okay. And then one over, so what we have here is that uh, pi is approximately three over one. That's one way to approximate pi as a fraction. Now, um, we can also say that one over epsilon zero is seven plus 0 0.06 uh whoops, sorry, uh, 615, okay, and this is a one, and this is epsilon one. And so we have now that pi is approximately three plus one over seven. And now we can continue we say one over epsilon one is equal to 15 plus 0 0.99654. And then, so that of course is a one, this is epsilon one, uh, sorry, a two, and this is epsilon two. And then we have now that pi is three plus one over seven plus one over 15. And we can continue like this um, because pi is irrational, then it would be uh, infinitely, there would be infinitely many terms, of course. If we were on a, a looking at a rational number, we could finish this sequence, but not with pi, of course. So now what is, so one thing that is really important about continued function expansion in the, in the scope of attacking RSA is that basically uh, once you get, if you have a rational number that is close enough to x, then it will appear as one of the convergence of the continued function expansion of x. So the theorem specifically says that let x be a rational number, okay, so that's the important part, and we suppose that p over q satisfies this, p over q minus x is less than this number here where the denominator is is related to uh, the, the 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 numerator of um, sorry the denominator here is related to the denominator of the uh, of p over q then p over q will appear as a as a as a as a convergent so the low exponent attack wants to leverage that by uh, taking e and n which are the public parameters and hope that something about the key will show up in the continued function expansion of e over n, where e and n are the public parameters. Now, it only applies, and thank God it does only apply in certain conditions, because otherwise uh, it would be completely, RSA would be completely insecure. So it only happens when d is small, and small meaning less than a third of the fourth root of n. So, and, and also P and Q have to be related by this condition. This is actually uh, quite realistic. What it means is P and Q are about the same size. This, on the other hand, needs to be avoided, okay? So this is an unusual situation and uh, it should be avoided. Now, let's see how this works. First, the goal is, so given K such that ED is one plus K times five N, we want to show that uh, uh, e over n is very close to k over d. And then we argue, there, therefore, that k over d will show up in the continued function expansion of e over n. Now, uh, k uh, is not necessarily co-prime to d in this case, so if that's the case, you don't really learn all of d. But if k and d are co-prime, then this function exactly gives you d. So let's see uh, first the goal of, of showing that uh, uh, k over d and e over n are close. Uh, and then once we have that, then we'll finish by uh, showing 
uh, how we detect uh, uh, when we have k over d in the continued fraction expansion of e over n. So goal one is to prove the closeness of those two fractions. So we have that e d is one plus k times phi of n. So we can rewrite k n minus e d uh, in this form here, okay? And then uh, we can bound this, okay, by just k n minus k phi n and factor this by k, okay? So now we're gonna try to bound individually k and n minus phi, uh, phi of n. So k times phi n is e d minus one, that's less than e d, and then from the bound on d, okay, we know that this is going to be less than, and the fact that e, of course, is less than phi of n, and d is assumed to be less than this, then we have this inequality, okay? Now, we have a bound on k, okay? k was one of the factors here for which we wanted a bound. Now, let's try to have a bound on n minus phi of n. So n minus phi of n is, uh, you can decompose uh, n, n and phi of n as products and, and sums of p and q's. And so here is uh, the uh, uh, bound that you have. So because p and q are assumed to be within a factor two of each other, you have that this is less than three times q, okay? And now q itself being less than uh, square root of n, then you have this inequality here. So that will give you the inequality that you're seeking between n minus phi of n and a function of n. Okay, so now we are able to bound this number here, okay, because it was a product of two things that we know how to bound, and that gives us this bound here, okay? So kn minus ed is less than three n to the three quarter, okay? Now we divide by d and n, and we obtain this inequality here. So you see now we're going to want this to be small. Okay, because we want to argue that k over d minus e over n is small. So since we have d, uh, so since we have this inequality on d, then we have uh, that this is less than one over three d, and one over three d is less than uh, 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 one over three d square, and then uh, uh, and one over two d square. Okay, so. Um, uh, so what we have is here is that one e over n minus k over d is less than one over two d squared. So that's what we wanted. But then of course we are uh, we we have to face uh, the decision of given a convergence, how do we decide that it's of the form k over d, where d is our secret? Surely if we don't know d, we would have to perform a test. Now there's no uh, be, given that d is supposed to be the inverse of e, one thing we could do is multiply by e and reduce it by phi of n, but we don't have phi of n. So it's not completely obvious how to check that a given d really is the d that we want, given only e and, and n, which are the public parameters. So how do we do this? Well, we hope, so we hope that a over b is k over uh, d. And then we compute this value here, which would be phi of n if the b and a are respectively d and k. Now, p and q are the roots of this polynomial. That's pretty obvious. This polynomial, you don't know how to form, of course, but you could compute this polynomial here where c will be replaced by phi of n uh, that you know how to do it, right? Because you can compute a polynomial that under the hypothesis that C is phi of n, okay? You've just computed C and you can compute this polynomial here. And then it's a polynomial of degree two, you can find its roots. If C is phi of n, then this polynomial would be X minus P, X minus Q, and the roots will be exactly P and Q. In any other uh, scenario, so either this polynomial is not even defined because it's not even a polynomial over the injures, or maybe the roots are not the ones, or so it may not have roots, or it may be that the roots are not p and q. If you find roots by some miracle that are integers, then you can easily test whether or not the multiplication of those two roots is n. Generally speaking, 
you will either not find roots or the roots won't be integers, in which case you don't even have to bother about verifying, okay? So this concludes uh, two examples of how to attack RSA. One of them was uh, generic, uh, and the other one was specific when the instantiation of, RSA, of the RSA parameters are bad. Thank you very much for your attention.